Dr. Bob Wallace. I was born in Ohio. My practice is in St. Petersburg, Florida. I saw my first HIV patient in 1983. So I've been here from the very beginning of the epidemic. Having lived in San Francisco in 1978 and seeing what was happening, and then when the cases started coming up, everybody was really afraid of what this was. And in St. Petersburg, it took a while before it actually came into our community. And the doctors were afraid. Um, in fact, when I started seeing HIV patients, I had two doctors call me and tell me that I was not to send any patients to them. They did not want them in their waiting room. As a family practice person, my, my whole motto of life is living the golden rule of treating other people the way you want to be treated yourself. And this was a population where people were dying and I had the opportunity to bring them in, get involved in clinical trials. And the more trials I got involved, the more interest I got in trying to see what we could do to make treatments better. My dream as a boy was to be on Broadway. <laughs> so AIDS became my Broadway. I got the chance to be on stage, I got the chance to speak. I was speaking to groups of a thousand people and became an AIDS educator here in Florida, for example, doctors have to have a one hour course to get their license renewed. And I went all over the state giving the AIDS education course at the end of the years so the doctors could get that. When I had to close my practice because of the insurance industry and how I wasn't able to stay open, I went into work with uh, a biotech company that had not had any drugs out yet, but I knew they had the drugs that were going to be the best. And so I was able to work with them and during my time there, we got four drugs. They got four drugs approved for HIV and one drug for hepatitis B. So I had the chance not only to sit with the experts of HIV, but I sat with the experts of hepatitis as well. In fact, one of the doctors, Mark Zolkowski from Johns Hopkins, when I started working with him, he had just finished his residency, and now he's one of the leading hepatitis doctors around the world. People contact him to get information. The first patient that I had who died, died with numerous Kaposi sarcoma lesions on his face. And his, he was actually a, a salesman for a furniture company and he was using funeral makeup trying to cover it and they had to let him go. He wasn't able to cover it up anymore. And the challenge that he had is he had told me in his visit with me that these lesions and things had come up a year before, but he had just taken out a insurance policy and didn't tell them that. So when he died, the insurance policy wouldn't pay and his parents were very angry at me because I had written in my chart that, that it had started a year before, but I didn't know about the insurance policy at the time. I made house calls on people. I would go to their homes. I would spend the evenings with them. Most people were dying at that time and we just held vigils. It was a very hard time, especially for those of us as doctors. We actually would have little groups where we would talk about how to handle so many of your patients dying because it was just really, really hard to get up every morning and go back to your office knowing that you were going to tell someone they were probably going to die. The cocktail didn't come around until 1995. So from 1987 to 1995, the only hope I had to offer my patients was to get involved in clinical trials, to have the clinical trials in my office, and allow them to participate. And there are many people in St. Petersburg walking around today who are there because we got them into the trials. I'm, I'm most proud of, and what was going on is the, the m trisidabine trial. It was called the FTC-303 trial. And that drug became m which is now part of four of the one pill once a day treatments. It's part of Truvada, Patripla, Stribild, and Complera. We did that study right in little old St. Peter's where I had more patients in that study than anyone in the world. I had a great opportunity with being on the pharmaceutical advisory boards and working with all the people that I did to attend all the conferences around the world in Paris, in Barcelona, in Dublin, in Warsaw. 
Vancouver, Seattle, everywhere that I could go, I would go to get as much education as I could. And the important thing about that is you got yourself known that people would contact me if they had friends moving to St. Petersburg, they'd say, hey, Dr. Bob, can you take on a new patient or can you help us find a, a doctor? When we came to the point where we had one pill once a day, people like George, international flight attendants who travel six time zones in one day, they have a hard time taking their medication. And once we got down to once a day, we were able to find a regimen that worked and he got undetectable. And because I worked for Gilead Sciences, we told them that story and everybody loved him anyway. And he was able to go up to New York and they did a photo shoot and he got to be one of the, the models on the literature that was put out to promote Viriad and Truvada because that's what worked for him. He got one pill once a day and he finally got to be undetectable. The information that the sales reps were passing out had a picture of my partner. They, they, what it was is they used four different people and he was one of the four people in the pictures. And they did a conference in Washington DC and they had the pictures on top of the cabs and there was George driving around Washington DC. And we went to one of the international conferences and they did this big plexiglass four by, I don't know how tall it is, picture of him and it was lighted from the bottom in a, in a frame and after they were done they gave it to me and I have that as my memory. And in January of 2006 he called me from Hawaii and I said George please come home and he came home and it was non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. I called all of my friends with, with the advantage I had of knowing all the people around the country. I knew the experts. I knew the people that could treat lymphoma, not Hodgkin's lymphoma. And they were giving me terrible, <laughs> terrible things. They'd say, Bob, just keep him comfortable. And he lived 15 months. He lived 15 months because he believed he was going to beat it. And that gave me enough strength to move on and do the things I'm doing now. He died in 2007 and after his death I spent four years alone and his memory and his spirit are driving me today to do what I do. Worries and one of my favorite patients was a lady named Tina and she came to me in 1998 she had been infected using IV drugs in New Jersey as a teenager and she did not want anyone to know she had the virus. In fact, she was working at a, a fire station where they just kept telling gay jokes and AIDS jokes and she had to sit there and listen to them and she finally quit because she couldn't take it anymore. But her request of me is, please keep me alive to get my son through graduation. And so we worked with Tina, we got her into trials, we did every combination we could get to, to get her to take. But she would have trouble. She had problems with the regimens and for those people who remember the regimens back in the, the early 80s and early 90s, they were hard to take. You know, some, some regimens were 26 pills a day. But she kept on and she kept taking them and kept taking them. And I was so grateful that I got to take her to her son's graduation in 2000. And I got to be there with her. And she died a year later. I have a woman who went to Africa as a missionary back in the late 80s and she was raped and she was infected with HIV. And she's had to hide that the whole time. Now I left practice for a while and I'm coming back and she's going to be able to come back and see me again as my patient. And I'm looking forward to taking care of her. And talking about and traveling the world, but the advantage of being in all of these international conferences is you get to see the worldwide epidemic. It is different in the developing countries. You know, when you look at the UK, they're not seeing new cases because they treat everyone. If you're HIV positive, you get put on medication and you're not going to infect anyone. In fact, the three main studies that were done that were so impactful, they looked at discordant couples, one in Uganda, 
one in Spain and one in Thailand. And what they found, this was right when we started putting people on treatment. And they found that if you put people on treatment and they got their viral load below 1,500 copies, they did not infect their partners. That the infection rate went down to nearly zero. So we have good evidence that if we treat people and get people treated, we could stop the spread of the virus. I came back into practice a year ago. I opened an office and went back into practice for two reasons. One was to help people with hepatitis C and one was to get back into HIV care because I've seen it in our community with crystal meth being used, with the number of people using IV drugs in the heterosexual population. We are seeing an increase and in fact, the first part of last Last year, compared to the first part of this year, the state of Florida saw a 27% increase in the number of HIV cases. And no one's out screaming. I'm, I'm on my soapbox again saying, we have to get back out there. And that's where this whole conversation about PrEP comes in, is that uh, the young people today, they weren't here when people were dying. And it's just like trying to tell people about the Holocaust. There are some people who just don't think that this happened, but we lived it. We were there. I buried most all of my friends in the 80s and the early 90s. But the young people today have no fear, and they think all they have to do is take a pill that prevents them from getting infected, but they're not using it appropriately. They're not taking the things that they need to do to take care of getting other infections. And in our area, for example, genotype 3 of hepatitis C is a very bad actor. It causes very severe disease. And in my practice, I'm seeing more and more genotype 3 in people in their 20s and 30s. And we're seeing more and more people coming in with HIV infection and I think it's going to continue to increase unless we really get out there. I was young then too. I wouldn't have listened to the older guys. And today, the name of our sacred covenant for God, whereby their hearts, their bodies, and their souls shall be united as one in marriage for the rest of their days.